I want to welcome everyone who's tuning in today. My name is Sharla Lambert. I'm the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer here at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Uh, in that role, I work with many different people across campus uh, to ensure the lab is an inclusive and supportive environment for all the students, staff, and scientists who work and conduct research here. I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, Live at the Lab, which I believe is the third installment uh, of the Education Innovators webinar series. Today, we'll be talking about pathways into scientific research and careers in scientific research, and specifically programs that are designed to introduce students um, to scientific research and how those programs are interconnected here at the lab. So with us today um, are four panelists. Uh, first up is Mon Mon Mayat. Uh, she's the Associate Dean of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory's School of Biological Sciences, uh, which runs the lab's PhD program as well as research programs for both uh, high school and undergraduate students. Uh, Connor Fitzpatrick is our next panelist. He's a third year PhD student in the School of Biological Sciences uh, studying cancer biology. Uh, next up is Jason Williams. Uh, he is the Assistant Director uh, in Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory's DNA Learning Center. Uh, which provides instruction in genetics, molecular biology, and technology for middle and high school students. And last but certainly not least, uh, our fourth panelist is Diana Benedicto Jimenez. Um, she's heading into her senior year at Paul D. Schreiber High School in Port Washington. Uh, so together the panelists have a wide variety of experiences with research, uh, and as I think you'll see, their experiences stem, uh, at least in part, from multiple programs and opportunities here at the lab. Um, so I want to thank the four of you uh, for participating in today's panel. I'm really excited about this discussion uh, since it combines two of my professional passions, scientific research, of course, uh, and also increasing access to scientific careers. So a couple of housekeeping notes for those of you who are in the audience. Um, you can type in any questions that you have into the Q&A window. Um, so you can get to that by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. We'll be able to see all your questions coming in, but you'll only be able to see the questions you submit. Um, there's going to be plenty of time uh, at the end for kind of an audience driven, driven Q&A session. Um, so please do send in your questions. All right. So I think we'll, we'll get started with some, you know, kind of just introductory questions, some personal stories. I'd like to give the panelists a chance to introduce themselves and their careers uh, and pathways into science to date uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, so to kick off the conversation, um, let's start with Mon. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background and your career, when you first became interested in science um, and also what you do at the lab now? So hello everyone. And as Shala mentioned, I work in the School of Biological Sciences at the lab. Um, this is my fourth year working in this position. But I was not new to the lab when I started because actually um, as a sophomore in college, I participated in the undergraduate research program, which we call, refer to as ERP at the lab here where I conducted research and interacted with the scientists here. And this experience that I had as a so after my sophomore year in college was a transformative experience for me because it really prepared me well for graduate school and the research career that followed. After college, I did my graduate training at the Rockefeller University and then my postdoctoral training at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. My first faculty position was at Weill Cornell Medical School. And there, um, in that role, I mentored uh, trainees at all different levels. So mostly graduate students and postdoctoral fellows who, ha who had done, had, who had finished the graduate training, but also high school students and undergraduate students from nearby schools. Um, and in addition, uh, at Wild Cornell, I also taught graduate and medical school classes. My second faculty position was at Medgar Evers College, which is a senior college within the CUNY or City University of New York educational system. And at Medgar Evers, I continue to teach and conduct research with undergraduate students, as well as helping them to apply to post bac and graduate programs. So in my current role here, um, I'm involved, as Charlotte mentioned, in the PhD graduate program, as well as this ERP or undergraduate research program that I was a participant of. 
So let me tell you just a little bit about each of those programs. So the PhD program that we have here, it's, um, it's a small program. We, we take about between nine and 11 students every year, and it is in its second, 22nd year. Of, uh, since it was founded. Um, I'm involved in different aspects of this program and that range ranges from teaching to recruitment activities. I also oversee the ERP program and um, which is now in its 62nd year. And part of the mission of this undergraduate research program is to provide research experience to undergrad students that normally would not have such opportunities at their own institution. Um, and in, in addition, the lab also has a Partners for the Future program, which you'll hear more of from Diana. And this is where high school seniors from Long Island schools conduct in original research at the lab. Now, in terms of how I first became interested in science and specifically in, in research, um, it was really as a high school student. So I'm originally from Burma, which is also known as Myanmar. And so I came to the US to attend high school at a boarding school. And at the time, my oldest sister was in graduate school herself. And so she, and so I would spend all my school breaks with her and pretty much just go with her to her lab to hang out. And really that's where I saw how a research lab functioned. And I was able to see the excitement of doing research as well as the daily struggles and the triumphs. And I got hooked right away. And you know, it, so it was then that I knew this is what I wanted to do as a career. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for that, Lon. Uh, okay, so we'll go to Connor next. So can you tell us a little bit about your career path to date, um, a little bit about what you work on uh, in your research, um, and also when you, when you could, when you first became interested in science? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Charla. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Connor Fitzpatrick. I'm a, a third year graduate student at the CSHL uh, School of Biological Sciences, uh, the program that uh, Mon is the associate dean of and uh, organizing. I work in the lab of Dr. Christopher Vakic, uh, studying cancer biology, specifically by leveraging uh, CRISPR-Cas9 genome technologies to find vulnerabilities uh, in different forms of cancer. And um, the funny thing about uh, my background in relation to the graduate school is that I think that I'm the only student, at least currently, that's in the graduate program that's local. So I'm actually from Long Island. I was born on the South Shore uh, in Bohemia. I attended a high school, uh, Connecticut High School, um, just on the South Shore. And that actually brings me to how I kind of got first interested in science was, uh, although my high school never actually took one of these cool trips to the DNA Learning Center that we'll hear more about. Uh, I did have a really great uh, chemistry teacher um, who I became very close with. And as many high school students were or uh, feel at that point, I didn't really know exactly where I wanted my future to take me. I was interested in a bunch of different areas. Uh, but when having discussions with her, she strongly encouraged me to pursue uh, biochemistry at uh, whatever institution I ended up going to for my undergrad. And she was actually uh, previously a, a, a clinical forensic scientist. And she really encouraged me to, to check that world out. Um, so then uh, sticking to my Long Island roots, I ended up at Stony Brook and did my undergraduate there work there, uh, earning a degree in biochemistry uh, at Stony Brook University. And early on, I was able to get an opportunity um, which is something that's really great about Stony Brook as well as Cold Spring Harbor um, uh, of getting into laboratory research at a, at a young age. So I started when I was about 18 in my freshman year uh, because they highly encourage undergraduate research there. And I ended up working in a research lab there for four years straight. And while I was there, I fell in love with science. I absolutely knew that's what I wanted to do. But at the time I was also exposed to a lot of uh, medicine and, and other different career paths. So I wanted to take a little time between undergraduate and graduate school before fully committing to a life in, in, in scientific research. So I took a few years off working at multiple labs at uh, UCLA doing immunogenetics. And then when I actually came back to Long Island, I accepted a research technician position here at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, working with Dr. Linda Von Alst, uh, uh, doing molecular neuroscience and, and trying to understand 
uh, genetic neuro, uh, neurological diseases. And during that time, I absolutely fell in love with the campus here and the environment and pretty much everything about it. And so when it came time to apply to graduate school, I applied and to my delight, I was accepted. And uh, it was uh, pretty much uh, an easy choice for me to, to stay here. And yeah, that's pretty much my whole background and path. Thank you for that. Such a great Long Island story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so speaking of great Long Island stories, we'll move to uh, Jason next. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about yourself, where you're from and what you do with the DNA Learning Center? Sure, I am also one of the uh, local uh, Long Islanders. Uh, I grew up here. I, I went to Half Hollow Hills, so a little bit closer, but uh, you know, uh, on the way uh, close to here, I knew, knew nothing about what Cold Spring Harbor uh, was or is. Uh, always uh, was one of those sort of science geek kind of kids. Uh, although, as we'll talk later, you know, that's not the only way to get interested in science. Although, as you have heard. Um, it's a lot of kind of being exposed or having that one teacher uh, or having some introduction of, of getting you interested uh, in the sciences. I, I think I was always interested. Uh, I, uh, as I'm listening to the stories, thinking back to high school and in the ninth grade where I was keeping mice in my closet uh, and I had different, you know, experiments going and exposing them to light and seeing what, you know, so all sorts of different things. It was always so fun to me. And uh, also was a, a graduate of Stony Brook, where I was working actually in plant science. Well, I was working in, um, I was working with plant sciences that time and uh, came actually to Cold Spring Harbor in 2004. So just after I graduated from there um, and started working in the labs uh, again on uh, plant development and then later on a little while on cancer. And then finally at the DNA Learning Center. Um, so. What we do at the Learning Center in, in some ways is uh, we might be the first foot in the door, the first step for uh, young students who want to be able to uh, you know, enrich what they're doing in school uh, by really sort of mixing it with uh, technologies and techniques and the science that's happening at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. So um, what I do in my role currently um, I spend a lot of time uh, uh, training and teaching uh, not just students, but also faculty members uh, to help them to bring those technologies and approaches into the classroom. So that could be at the high school level, at the undergraduate level. And then uh, most recently, we've been really working to increase our ability to uh, give access to students who might not have had the chance so through uh, one of our programs uh, that we had started about two years ago, uh, this science technology uh, research scholars program, the STARS program, um, we really reached out to find uh, high school students all over Long Island, including Diana, who is one of them, uh, and, and give them uh, a chance to really see what's going on in the lab here. And in a program that we're developing really even over the last several months, Research Ready, we are also uh, working uh, as the Dean Learning Center back today, uh, just graduated, I guess you could say, its first summer camp week in Brooklyn at our new center uh, that's, uh, down in, uh, that's down as a cooperation actually with CUNY. So my, that was, there's many, many details in there and all over the place, but really a lot of what we try to do is make science open and approachable uh, because so many people uh, really find interest in it, or that interest can really be sparked, and especially if we do that at a young age. Uh, so that's that's the intention every day walking in uh, to find out how we can spark something in the mind of a young person and eventually have them come back and as Mond <laughs> be the graduate, uh, the dean of the graduate school, be a scientist in the lab. That's, that's what we're uh, doing at the Learning Center. Yes, I love that. There's a, um, I don't know, sort of a, a way of thinking that you know everybody's born a scientist, everybody's born thinking like a scientist, and at some point it kind of, you know, like gets beaten out of you or something. Yeah. So you, so you're trying to, you know, encourage people to keep that way of thinking throughout their whole lives. Um, okay. So for our last uh, kind of more detailed introduction, we'll go to 
uh, to Diana. So uh, her connection to the lab has been alluded to, but uh, I'll let you tell your story uh, from here. Thanks. So as Charlotte said, I'm Diana. I'm a rising senior at Paul D. Shriver High School in Port Washington, Long Island, New York. And um, how I became interested in science, um, I always thought I was interested in science, even from a very young age. My mom's actually a massage therapist. And when she was in massage school, she would have this giant textbook of anatomy and physiology. And I would remember that I would read that book and was instantly so infatuated with biology and how like the human body works. So um, from a young age, I did want to become a doctor. Um, and I remember that in elementary school, my school district would take us frequently to the DNA Learning Center, where we would be shown like these very basic lab techniques, but I was always really interested in that, so that really feeded into my interest in science. And then when I was in high school, um, as everyone mentioned before, I participated in the Science, Technology, and Research, the STARS program at Cold Spring Harbor Labs. And there I actually was introduced for the first time to a real scientific laboratory on the main campus. And I was able to not only learn how to do laboratory techniques, but I also met with scientists and learned more about the amazing research going on at Cold Spring Harbor Labs. And that really prompted me to change my career interest to more of a on the bench type research rather than um, being um, in, in like the medical path. And this, sorry, this year I am a Partners for the Future. Um, I'm part of the Partners for the Future program where I get to intern in a lab, uh, which happens to be the same lab that Connor is working on. And um, I'll, I'm mentored by a postdoc and I get to learn and be part of the scientific community in a way that I've never been before. So that's pretty much my story. Nice. And Partners for the Future, um, just for the benefit of the audience. So it goes um, basically through your first term in your senior year. So through December, is that right? Yes. All right. Um, and also for the benefit of everyone in the audience, uh, when we were prepping for this, we knew that Diana was uh, going to be as part of the Partners of the Future program, but we didn't know until last week that she was actually assigned to Connor's lab. So it's it's like it's like we knew all along. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, what I'll do next, I'll move into just some general questions and to kind of build on um, some of the themes, the common themes in people's introduction. Uh, and then we'll have some time uh, at the end, uh, again, for the audience uh, Q&A. So there's some questions coming in now, please do keep them coming in um, and we'll get to them after uh, this, this next sort of little bit. Um, so for the, the first question I want to ask, um, just to make it a little bit more concrete, uh, again, for the benefit of our audience members, um, I wanted to see if you, you could all kind of describe a day in the life uh, of research. Um, so if you go by what you see on the internet, scientists just wear lab coats all day and play with um, test tubes of colored liquids. Um, and I know that's not the experience of anyone on this panel. Um, so maybe um, if you can describe um, kind of what a day in your life is like. Um, and then also um, if there are things that you do, you know, while you know doing research uh, that surprised you when you first got into it and you're like i didn't realize this was actually a big part of being a scientist um so maybe we'll start with connor since uh, he's he's actively in the phd program right now yeah yeah I'd, i would love to talk about that so yeah and charlotte i feel like you you hit the nail on the head and i feel like that's how kind of everyone sees science uh, admittedly myself when i was young i mean just watching tv movies anything uh, this image of just like folks running around in lab coats and like, you know, making these discoveries is on a day to day basis with these fun colored liquids is, is how you kind of see science. And, and although some of that is is certainly true, um, it, it, it's definitely not the full story. So, I mean, uh, if I had to walk you through a, a sort of typical day uh, during my graduate research, um, just like anyone, I try to get to work relatively early for, for me personally, I, I like to get the day started um, pretty early. And what I first start it, to do is I kind of make a, a, a list of scientific experiments that I want to get accomplished that day. Uh, typically, I'll have like a weekly plan of the broad kind of things that I want to get done. Uh, but the first thing I do is I start out by just writing down all the things that I want to get done that day. 
and yeah, so then a lot of the, the most of my days does end up, you know, kind of in that picturesque image of putting on the gloves and transferring little bits of liquid to other little bits of liquid and then putting them in a machine and, and getting a readout and getting excited about it or not so excited about it. Uh, but there's a lot more than that uh, in a typical day, especially in the graduate program here. Um, there's uh, a lot of collaboration, in, especially in my lab, as Diana can attest to now that uh, she's working with us. Um, there's a lot of conversations that go on. If I get a result that I'm a little confused about, I might seek out another graduate student or go to another postdoctoral fellow who has a little bit more experience and kind of discuss that and, and talk to them about it. Um, sometimes these experiments that uh, you do that um, are, are very complicated and also have like these long steps of like two hours incubation periods so during that time I'll read papers or I'll be writing something uh, like a review for a particular topic with my PI uh, from my principal investigator, the professor that I work under, um, preparing presentations because in science you often have to present your work at, at different conferences and to your own lab and lab meetings. So a lot of reading, a lot of discussions, uh, all sorts of stuff like that. And then also, I mean, every lab is a little bit different. I've worked now in four different labs officially and I've rotated in an, in an additional two. And every lab has uh, its own different environment, uh, but I'd say most labs, you know, have uh, a decent amount of social activity. And so, you know, as we're talking about stuff, we'll say like, oh, like, you know, let's go hang out after this. We'll go down and grab like some dinner or whatever. So there's also a lot of intercommunication. Um, and yeah, and then there's also, you know, I, it's not just me at the bench, you know, pouring liquids into liquid. There's also a major computational side to most research projects. Now I'm personally uh, what's considered primarily a bench scientist where most of the work I'm doing with my hands with test tubes and cells and and plates and all that but you, even with uh, being like very much on that end of the, the coin um, I still have to do a lot of computational work um, so I, I do a lot of programming and trying to figure out all sorts of different stuff with the the massive amount of data that's been poured in through uh, sequencing next generation sequencing technologies. Um, so yeah, I mean, a typical day, it's, it's hard to describe like what I do every single day, but uh, definitely a lot of experiments, a lot of discussing different topics with my, my colleagues and um, a lot of kind of random different other sorts of things that I kind of have to do. And then also there's a lot of mentoring involved. So like for me personally, I've had uh, recently, I've had two undergraduate or two other graduate students who have joined the lab recently, where I was their like official de uh, designated mentor, where I taught them kind of from the ground up how to pipette like these liquids and work with these tools and stuff. So it's uh yeah, it's it's a rewarding environment in in the way that it it, it it's not just the monotony of experiments day by day. There it gets broken up by a lot of different things. And uh, you sometimes, some days I won't even have time to do experiments because I'll just be mentoring and then I'm in a meeting and then this or that, so. But yeah, so I, I think that a day in the life of a scientist is, it's uh, kind of uh, very different than what's necessarily portrayed in m most media, but um, there's definitely a good amount of experiments too. <laughs> yes. No, I love what you said about um, social interaction and, you know, sort of being able to mentor, um, you know, sort of people who are coming up, but also you going and asking a lot of questions and getting input from a lot of people and doing that over dinner and doing that on the way to the volleyball courts or, you know, any other places that these conversations um, can take place. Um, does anybody want to add anything uh, to that, pick up on anything that Connor said? Yeah, I just like to emphasize the mentoring. Um, in that you know, from a uh, professor or lab head point of view on a regular day, there's a lot of mentoring that goes on. And you know, and, it dep and, the, and you do different type of mentoring depending on what level your training at, is at, whether it's a high school student to a postdoc fellow, because you have to always be thinking about what their next step is, right? And so that will dictate what, you know, what, you know, how you mentor them. Um, and that involves not just the experiment that's in, right in front of you, but also, um, 
in terms of career development and what are the types of skills they should acquire and what their next steps should be. So there, there's definitely a lot of mentoring going on. And um, I also want to emphasize that, you know, the lab environment can be a lot of fun, right? It's not just, you know, serious scientists and white lab coats pouring liquid into liquid. So, you know, kind of touch upon some of the things that make it fun, like lab lunches, um, volleyball, as Charlotte mentioned, um, you know, sometimes, you know, we would have a music box in the lab and we would play music and there'll be some dancing involved and, you know, a lot of laughter and things like that. So it can be a really fun place that you feel at home and you create your own community within the lab as well. And, and sorry, I, uh, just to, I know Jason wants to pitch in too, but I, just to bridge off of what, what Mon said, is uh yeah so like the european football cup is going on right now and oh my gosh it's basically like there's like if like there we have a graduate student from portugal so during the portugal matches that day of his you know experiments like he just had to block that out and you know you'd randomly hear him cheering and stuff and then we'd all go to the conference room and stuff and you know it's one of the great things about science i think is that uh, a lot of the environments like allow you that opportunity to like even during the day as long as you're getting your work done to to have those social interactions and have a lot of fun with your colleagues and stuff, so. And you end up forming lasting uh, friendships with people in your lab, right? Because not just for the fun times, but the times when experiments do not work. And there's a lot of times when that happens. And so you have the support system for you to you know, move beyond the failed experiments. I was only gonna add, because I know there's other topics you wanna get to that I happily perpetuate the stereotype of lab coats. I bought my lab coat in high school before like I even did my first experiment and I still wear them as often as I can even though I don't necessarily need to because then you don't have to worry about what you're wearing underneath. Like you can wear the same shirt three days in a row if you need to, uh, but it's fun. And most of my time, even like today was today, last four days of teaching faculty how to do statistics in R. And so we were, you know, doing the computational side, but you really do have that nice fun side. I, my favorite parts was I used to go around the lab building with a coffee cup collecting money for pizza because we had, it was movie night that, that week. So, you know, you, you have that kind of atmosphere too. I'm so impressed that you wear lab coats all the time, Jason. I have exactly one. I'm a computational scientist by training. <sighs> There was never any reason for me to wear a lab coat, but I have a beautiful one. It has like purple embroidered name and like a logo on it. Right, so, exactly. Got to enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so we'll we'll move on to the next question. Um, and just to kind of build off of that, so in your personal experiences, um, what factors um, have contributed to your continuing interest uh, in scientific research? Um, and I'll, I'll start with Diana for this one. I know you've only just begun Partners for the Future and um, you, you mentioned uh, that STARS was this really transformative experience because you got to see what was in a lab. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What do you think were the factors were that you know, kind of really sparked your interest and, and made you uh, want to do Partners for the Future? Yeah, so um, I think that one of the biggest factors that really contributed to my interest in science is um, definitely this continuous exposure to what it really means to be working in a laboratory. Um, like back to when I started the STARS program, um, I've never been in a laboratory before and most of my expectations really fell into that um, archetypal scientist with the lab coat, liquids into liquids. Um, but when I actually did get to um, interact with these scientists and realize that they're actually real people with real lives uh, too, then um, I definitely became uh, much more interested. And also uh, the community was also a very appealing factor um, to my interest in science um, as a Partners for the Future um, program. Uh, uh, participant. Uh, I definitely did to experience that scientific community firsthand. And as Connor said, I did watch the Euro Cup with my mentor and saw this other side. Um, not only was it all just work, but we do have play at the right time. So I think that was really appealing to me along the way. Nice. Does anybody else want to add, um, just sort of building on the factors, um, kind of Sounds like people is a big theme. The you know kind of the social community is a big thing. Are there other factors that kind of contribute to your continuing interest? 
Yeah, I, I could chime in if that's okay. I mean, uh, I, I actually, I think I have a pretty short answer to this question. I mean, I, I've always loved learning and I've always loved solving problems. And uh, the cool thing about science, uh, it's, it can be a double-edged sword in some ways, but you know, you, you put in a lot of time to ask these certain questions. And so when you're working day in and day out, it's not this sort of instant gratification that I think a, a lot of us uh, get used to sometimes. Like sometimes you're working on just one question for weeks to months at a time. And then when you get that answer, it's really exciting and empowering, even if it's not necessarily the answer you might've wanted. Um, and also like it's, it, I, I talk to a lot of people who are graduating college and, and they always say to me like, oh, like, at least a lot of people I, I've, I've spoken to have said to me like, oh, like, I wish I could just like learn, like I could, that could just be my job. And I'm like, well, you should be a scientist because that's, that's the whole thing is like, you think like, oh, like, well, I got my biochemistry degree, but there's so much beyond that. And there's so much to learn. And then, then you include the people and the environments. And it's, it's just such a, it's a career choice. I would never turn back. I was going to jump in and, and say that, uh, in particular, the role that Cold Spring Harbor has, and a lot of us have, is that uh, Cold Spring Harbor is very much interested in basic research. There's applied research, too, when we're actually directly working on maybe something that's clinical and it's like really at the sort of the, the, the tail end of what happens. But there's a whole bunch that comes before you get to that. And if we think over the last year, um, all of the things that have gone in, for example, into uh, finding treatments and, and vaccines uh, and for, of course, COVID, but there's, there's still many other uh, problems solved. And all of those things, they don't start in the hospital. They start way back before in lots of the stuff that we're doing. And so there, there, there's that part, and I've had my hand in that part sometime. And now my hand is in the teaching part where you know, I literally get to affect thousands of people uh, who may come in the door and uh, they may five years from now find a cure for something that previously was uncured. And it's always also wonderful to hear people um, and see them, you know, I go to conferences and someone will come up to me who I'm so horrible with faces, I will not remember them, but they say, hey, I took your class last year or I took this course that you taught last year when you taught it, I had never opened the computer to do any of this type of analysis. And now I just assembled the genome of this thing, or I just found a gene that did something, or I just did that, right? So uh, to have that really wonderful opportunity to, uh, to, ca to catalyze people and to give them that little spark that they need that gets them to do the next step, that's a really wonderful aspect of what we have access to in the scientific community. And Cold Spring Harbor in particular, uh, you know, during the uh, normal times, and which we're, we'll be back to again soon, hopefully, thousands of scientists pass through here because Cold Spring Harbor is a hub, uh, as, as Charlotte knows, for meetings and for courses and for, for other scientists to come and to learn here. So we really have this uh, fantastic impact on people. We'll never know, you know, 10%, you know, we, we only see maybe 10% of it and the 10% that we see is wonderful. So uh, it's that really chance to affect other people in their work that ultimately creates benefit for everyone. And that's, that's one of the factors that's motivating for sure. So speaking of community, I just want to add that um, Cosmic Harper Lab community is, I find very unique and different from any of the other scientific communities that I have been part of. Um, at the lab here, everybody is very interactive and, and collaborative. And on any given day in normal times, you will see um, people at different levels talking to each other. So it's very you know, normal to, to see a high school student or undergraduate student um, having a serious scientific conversation with a faculty member. Um, and it's and it, it happens very organically. Um, you know, it could be in the parking lot, in the cafeteria where we all eat. Um, but that that's something that I I noticed since I was when I uh, participated in the art program, and it's still true this day when I came back that this uniqueness about the Coastal Harbor Lab community and how um, interactive it is and collaborative compared to other other communities. All right, thank you all for that. I will agree 100%, especially with um, what Jason was saying about, you know, kind of 
being able to teach other people and affect their lives in a positive way um, is a, a really great kind of motivating factor for sure. It's one that I experience all the time. Um, okay, so for our next kind of open question, um, I want to dig in a little bit more to uh, the stereotype about what a scientist is. Um, and so even in even now in 2021, there's a stubborn stereotype. It's not just a person who wears a lab coat all day and plays with colored liquids. It's a very specific kind of person. Uh, usually an older white man with crazy hair and glasses, looks kind of like Einstein, um, who's deemed brilliant at a very early age and sort of plucked um, from his kindergarten class and went on to private schools and Ivy League institutions his whole life and sort of given all of the resources um, to be able to think great thoughts. Uh, in fact, in the reality though, like that stereotype just doesn't hold up at all. Um, uh, and in fact, there's lots of evidence now that shows that um, a diversity of life experiences among the people who do science uh, actually increases creativity, productivity, um, innovation, overall progress uh, in science. So older white men with crazy hair are scientists for sure, uh, but scientists are also women, they're people of color, LGBTQ, from all kinds of socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, so for the, for the panelists, what have you seen be particularly effective um, when it comes to broadening access to careers in scientific research? And perhaps once and for all, kind of shaking the stereotype of who a scientist is. Um, I'll, I'll start with Mon, because I know um, you've alluded to a lot of the great work that the graduate school does in this program already. So the school is he um, heavily involved in, uh, in diversity recruitment activities. And there's a number of ways that we reach students with diverse backgrounds. And these include um, visiting an extensive number of, let's say, um, nat national conferences, um, graduate student fairs. And we also make um, personalized visits to, let's say, senior colleges and community colleges in the tri-state area, where there's limited research opportunities for the students there. And that includes the various colleges within the CUNY system um, clo close to home here as well. And additionally, um, we host a diversity recruitment day where we invite undergraduate students from minority groups that are underrepresented in the sciences to spend a day at the lab. Um, they meet current students, postdoctoral fellows and faculty. They learn about the research that's going on in the various labs and not just, not just the research, but they also hear from the students and the postdocs about their own personal journeys um, that led them to doing research at Cold Spring Harbor Lab. And, you know, um, and it's a fun way for them to see the campus, which is beautiful, and also to really learn what it's like to be a scientist and what is the path, um, the different stages um, for doing for doing scientific research. Nice, thank you for that. I think I think the the undergraduate research program that you mentioned about that is particularly important to kind of emphasize because I know there are lots of summer undergraduate research program experiences that are aimed at people who come from schools where there's already a lot of research resources and research experiences available to them. Um, so I think the fact that uh, you all do so much kind of outreach and recruitment specifically to schools that who don't have that, those resources um, is a really unique feature of the, the summer herb program. Mm -hmm. Jason, you wanna add uh, to that? Sure, yeah. I think, you know, representation is really, really important. And I mean, um, I this you know I finished my vaccine and so I could take off my mask and then it was like when I'm walking into a room like oh God, I don't have my, you you instantly have a feeling that you know you're different right uh, even something that's small like that or even when you're talking we're talking about sports right if you show up and you're wearing the wrong jersey right human beings have a natural knowledge and and, and sort of looking around and being able to to feel, hey, am I welcome here? Do I feel included or do I not, right? I've gotten the, the you don't look like a scientist, right? You've gotten that phrase, right? But if I think about walking around Cold Spring Harbor, there is no one on a, on, you know, a normal day walking around in a lab coat with a giant white afro. There is, not, there is not that. There's nobody really who you would point to them and say that they look any different from anyone else. And I bet for all of the people that are watching this, uh, if you've listened to our conversations, you've probably heard things that resonate with you, like, oh, that sounds fun, or I'd like to be a part of that, right? Um, so really, we want, we want to, um, you know, really change the narrative that really anyone can be that scientist. It's a profession that is really connected to your own interests and what you'd like to do. And at the same time, 
uh, one of the responsibilities that we have is to promote the sort of the, the fullness of who are the people that are uh, doing the science at Cold Spring Harbor and elsewhere, so that especially for people who may be wondering whether they can quote unquote be a scientist, but they look and they can see someone who look like they might have their cultural experience, might have their background, might come from the South Shore, right? Whatever it is, you want to hear somebody else that um, kind of knows what it's like to come from where you come from, that they've done that, and then therefore that you can do that too. So we really want to make sure we tell every story so that people really feel, okay, this is something that I can do as well. Well said, thank you, Jason. Um, so to, to kind of just build on that, are there are there stories that you've seen um, from the DNA Learning Center, sort of um, the impacts um, of introducing students um, kind of early on um, to, you know, concepts and research, things that they might not have access to in their schools? Like what are, you know, what are some of the benefits and some of the, the, um, the impacts that you've seen? Yeah, well, you know what? The, the DNA Learning Center has a very strong uh, uh, philosophy and approach in teaching, which is that we're hands-on centered. And so um, we actually de-emphasize, and this is uh, something that's actually um, becoming more important in education, the lecture. Uh, yes, you at some point will have to get the lecture. You will have to read the books. You will have to uh, get some of the background material, but it's very, very powerful to just put a student in front of a microscope and let them look at something that's crawling around or that's in the water. I can't think of any young person, uh, you, you can be squeamish of course, but I can't think of any young person when you give them that look at something they've never seen who isn't curious, right? That's really what we uh, want to connect people to. And then once we have that hook, once you're curious about something, once you see uh, uh, at that at, at that that early or that critical moment, then you have the motivation because really no one can teach you anything. And I always tell students that I cannot teach you anything. I can make you want to learn. I can, uh, or I hopefully that's what I'm going to try to do. I can put you in front of the book. I can put you in a situation. But if I don't give you that enthusiasm and if I don't turn on your curiosity, I, I'll just sit here and, and and we won't accomplish anything. And so. Uh, when we early on, um, one of the early experiences was, was teaching in the DNA Learning Center in Harlem, where we have a lot of students. It's what you would consider inner city. It's students that may not have a lot of advantages and not, may not be exposed. And so instantly, my goal as a teacher is to say, how can I connect to these students and make them see that something that seems really distant and really removed from them is actually connected to everyday life. And so uh, really, we want to do that. And um, you want to do it at, a, at an early age or expose people, even the, you know, our programs start in middle school, because actually what we know, and it, it's, it's also uh, from the research, uh, particularly in, uh, a problem for students that are underrepresented minority students, is that they usually want to do the same things that other students do but they may have already been excluded or already sort of, you know what, you're not getting good grades or you are a problem kid uh, because you, you know, you're all over the place. So there, there are things that can happen to a student that dampen and sort of drive down the, those interests to the point at which they, they've already said, I can't do this or school is boring or all of those different types of things can happen to a student. Whereas what we're offering is let's put the fun first, let's show them that, and then if we can get people excited, engaged, they'll want to go through the hard parts of figuring out, okay, how do I get to that next level? If you see a, a kid playing a video game, they play and they continue and the game gets harder, right? But they want to solve the challenge because now they're interested in it. And we should teach science and we have such an opportunity to teach science in a way that students um, get fascinated first, they see the value, they get interested in it, then they, they're, they're hooked and we can't stop them from learning. So that's something we really, uh, we really do at the Learning Center and uh, really Cold Spring Harbor, which is this really uh, high level institution, uh, isn't just for, for you know, world leading professors and experts and Nobel laureates, but it's also for middle school students. 
Nice. Thank you for all that. It's, so many things you said resonated with me. I mean, I've seen, um, I think because science was taught out of a book for so long, you know, because it had to be, because that was sort of, you know, the way to scale it. Um, you know, the, the idea that science is really creative and that it's hands on and that it's really social, um, you know, sort of you know, changes people's lives because they assumed, you know, being a scientist and doing scientists, science was what they saw out of a book and that's not engaging for most people. <laughs> um, but the fact that it's really creative and that um, it's actually really fun um, and, and there are lots of programs that as you say, put the fun first now, um, that's much more hopeful that um, it will sort of be engaging from here on out. I certainly learned from science from a book and I hated it for a really long time. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll move into uh, some of the audience Q&A um, now. There's some really good questions coming in. I wanted to start with, um, you know, kind of a philosophical one um, that I think is really good. And then there's lots of um, kind of just logistical questions that I think we'll be able to address pretty quickly. Um, and so this this um, question um, is about failure. Um, and so it seems that science entails a high affinity for questioning, testing, and possibly failing. Uh, can you share examples when failures lead to increased understanding? Um, or can you just talk a little bit more broadly about the importance of failing well in science, as they say? I love failure. Um, and in fact, even my favorite thing is watching other people fail, particularly my 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 uh, investigator, my principal investigator, who I'm watching, who I'm walking under. Um, I When I first started here, I had probably done this experiment, this PCR experiment, 10,000 times. And for the first two weeks I worked here, nothing worked. And then I said, they must be wondering, why did they hire me? Uh, and then we both looked into the books and to the notes and realized that the experiment I was trying, I was given the wrong stuff, it would have never worked, right? And then also, as you go on in the lab and you watch other people fail who you were like looking up to, like, wait a second, they got it wrong. And you just realize that that is part of being a scientist. And one of the most important things, and I'll want to get to a lot of questions, so I'll sum it up, is that uh, the, 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 the nice part of failure is when you get to a level at which you understand the science enough that you realize you're not failing because you're doing something wrong, but you're failing because there's something that nobody knows and you've on a piece of knowledge that no one understood before. And so now you've got, you've got to dig in. So failure is integral. We learn uh, as scientists to really uh, just run with it. And, and not be completely crushed by it. So it's, it's a great thing and, and, and we just share it openly and it's very healthy for us if we do that, not to get stuck with it. Yeah, and if I could add to that, Charla, uh, uh, I completely agree with what Jason had said. And I, it, one of the things I found so great about science when I first got into it, when I was 18 years old working in a lab and I would make silly mistakes or even just do something I thought I did perfectly and it just didn't work out to, 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 you know, that, to have that initial kind of anxiety at that moment and be like, am I, I going to be in trouble? And then like realize that, you know, failure is a part of the process and every single lab I've worked in. And I could say this about most labs and most environments is it's encouraged because failure is absolutely the best tool to learn. And it, you, it gives you the chance to work from the ground up or go back and figure out what you might have done wrong. And I'll just give like a really brief anecdotal uh, example for the to kind of like really pointedly answer the question. Uh, and I could give tons of examples of the times I failed and then it turned out to be a good thing for me. But um, recently, one of the graduate students in our lab, uh, you know, was having a really hard time with their project and they were having kind of repeated failures of these experiments of these results that they wanted to get and they just couldn't find them to the point where they kind of stopped what they were doing at the advice of the professor and just went back to basics and just like took a look at the problem from the very beginning and actually found something like in the data from way long ago that ended up being the coolest story that she's now pursued for the past two years and it's actually probably going to be the, one of the best and most intriguing stories that's come out of our lab and she only was able to do that because she kind of hit the wall so many times that she had to break it back down to the very, very beginning and then kind of work her way back up. And, and uh, it's one of the things that my PI and many other PIs and professors kind of encourages, you know, 
it's not about failing. It's about how do you kind of handle it afterwards and, and learn from it. Perfect. Thanks, Connor. Um, all right. So I think in our last couple of minutes, um, uh, for those of you in the audience, there are a bunch of links now uh, in the chat where you can learn more about a lot of the programs that were mentioned here. Um, so I will um, get to a couple of the logistical questions just so um, we're, we're able to clarify things. Um, there's one question coming in. Uh, do programs like these exist at other labs and universities on Long Island or New York City? Um, and I know um, maybe Jason, you can talk about um, the the branch campuses of the DNA Learning Center. Um, yes, yeah, so there is a DNA Learning Center, uh, the, the most recent one that's opened at uh, Brooklyn, and then also we'll be restarting in Regeneron, which is up in Westchester, uh, and also in Harlem. So there are opportunities in the city as far as Cold Spring Harbor. And then uh, you may be just like Diana, that that might be a stepping stone. Then you may come to visit the main campus. So those are some other things. And then um, you can certainly contact us. I think you'll find our contact information. There are similar, but I would say not exactly the same. Right? We have a little bit of unique stuff, um, but there are other opportunities to find internships and things like that um, in the city. Nice. And then how can high school um teachers help their students get involved. So either in Partners for the Future or with the DNA Learning Center. Yeah, so I think some notes are in the chat and those links uh, will tell you how high school teachers can get involved at the Learning Center. And then also Partners for the Future takes place on the main campus. So I think those links will be helpful for those. Um, okay, so one question coming in. Um, if you're gonna focus on just one pathway uh, to give people from underrepresented communities better access to careers in science, what do you think it should be? Yeah, so one pathway or one, you know, I don't know, one component maybe, um, since there are really so many pathways. That's such a hard question. And there's so many different, uh, there's so many different things that, uh, is the experience of being uh, underrepresented or just anybody trying to get into science. I think whatever pathway that you can give that person to help them, it sounds soft, but believe in themselves. If that person is interested, and then there is nothing that can stop them if, if we can maintain that interest. And it's also, it, it, it literally can be realizing that, that if they're in an environment that they're, they're pursuing their science or their learning and it's not nurturing, get out and find a different environment because it does exist. So if you're going to university or if you're in a lab where you are being uh, not nurtured and it's toxic to use that word, then go somewhere else because it's not you and there is a way to get through. So I would just say giving, giving that person the resilience, they can find their way as long as they avoid those sort of uh, ditches along the side of the road. Yeah, no, I think that's so important. And one of the things I think we we're trying to do with this panel today is show you everybody in the audience that there are a whole variety of ways, right? So early access and going to the DNA Learning Center when you're in middle school is really great. Um, some people, that's not an option, either because you don't live near a DNA Learning Center campus or your school didn't, you know, sort of run field trips there. Um, so even beyond that, there's there's so many different ways. And I think the important thing is to, you know, sort of spark the interest in science uh, and then figure out what kind of works. Um, and then I think what Jason just said is really, really important. So if if something isn't working out, it's not, you know, you know, there there are other pathways and other environments in which to be a scientist. I remember just throwing it in there, some musicians that I admire talking about doing music and saying that even if I was not going to be paid, I would still have been a musician. And I think that's the truth for scientists that we would all be doing this. You know, as long as someone would feed us somehow, we would, we would keep doing this. So uh, that, that is, once you, once you can put that inspiration in somebody, they will be able to follow it. And it's just a matter of trying to make sure that we make it as smooth as possible. All right, I do wanna, I think that's a really great note to end on. Does anybody have um, sort of any final thoughts before um, we wrap up here? I just wanna add one thing, which is that, you know, we've talked about all these different programs that the, the Cosmo Harbor Lab offers. And, you know, 
at, at least at the undergraduate level, there's similar types of summer undergraduate research programs at other uh, universities and institutions on Long Island as well as in New York City. But if you don't get yourself into a program, you can always email a faculty member directly. And a lot of students don't even think about that or think like, oh, you know, like who would listen to me, right? But if you are really genuine about your interest in getting research experience, you can look on the website of a particular department or institute, find somebody that whose research interests, you know, like um, your, yours is aligned with and email them, introduce yourself and just show genuine interest that you want to volunteer and get some research, research experience, whether you are a middle school student, high school student or undergraduate student. And I have seen many success stories of, of students getting research experience that way, independent of any structured um, program. Nice. That's a yeah. That's a great point. I'm glad you were able to get that in. Um, yeah. So I will definitely end on that note. That's a very optimistic note to end on. So I want to thank everybody who joined us uh, today for tuning in. Please check out the links uh, in in the chat and uh, take a look at any of the programs um, at Cold Spring Harbor for ideas or things that you're actually you know specifically interested in um, here at Cold Spring Harbor Labs. Uh, and uh, we'll see you at the next webinar. Hopefully. Bye everyone.